I am at this time going to invite Dr. Jeff Raber up to give a talk for us on the chemical process of extraction. Thank you. opportunity to present to everyone here today and I hope it's a little less technical and more exciting than the last one but it was very informative I learned a lot too uh, so that's been very useful so it was a, a nice presentation as well so I want to talk a little bit about how the world's going to change from where it was in the pre you know the recent past to where it's going in the much more recent future as regulations are implemented and laws start to change so it's going to be a very different environment than what we have had before. It's going to be much more sophisticated, technically challenging, and the regulator is going to be breathing down everyone's neck. It's going to be a very interesting space, um, but one that offers a lot of opportunity for all of us to really operate out in the open and demonstrate you know, all of our technical acumen as well as our creativity and abilities to help many people uh, really enjoy cannabis in a large variety of ways. And I think the diversity that we see across the community as well as the diversity of products that we can generate from this marvelous plant are simply going to be amazing once we're finally really able to get our hands on it. So a little bit about our entity, the workshop. Um, I started the company with my brother back in 2010. We've been operating in Southern California. Uh, we recently had expanded to Washington a little over a year ago, and I'm happy to say that we are now coming to Oregon a little bit later this year. So. And, and our first and major goal was how do we help entrepreneurs, uh, others go out there and really benefit from the technical skill sets that we have. So my background, I have a PhD in organic chemistry and a bachelor's in biochemistry. So I'm a trained synthetic organic chemist. Uh, we use analytical tools all the time to know exactly what we've made, what we haven't made, or what is really causing us problems or what we're trying to make. Um, but we're really you know, interested in manipulating matter and trying to derive compounds into ones of interest in a variety of ways. We, we thought like cannabis is so useful, so valuable that I'm not going to try to synthesize anything from it. We'll let the plant do all the work and we'll harvest what the plant produces, which is really a good environmental approach so that you can you know, harness CO2 from the atmosphere, put more plants and trees down uh, and really act in a sustainable fashion. So sustainability is a big mindset for us, how we can use education and information to help guide legislators, lawmakers, regulators, other doctors, scientists, and things of that type to really generate good, solid information that is the foundation, like the foundation and fundamental position for everyone to understand how we can go forward in the best possible way. And in helping entrepreneurs, we set up a structure that was first offering services so that we could offer analytical or processing services so that people could use those types of back-end skill sets that you might not be able to acquire because the equipment is very expensive or the training can be very difficult, but also to help people drive their brands, be compliant with regulations, and set up a model where different states can have their own team. So our team in Oregon is a local team. They've been here, they've lived here for a long time and good friends of mine for a number of years. Uh, and I'm very excited about what the team here is going to do, and I'm very happy they're going to be integrated with the community here as well. So what we've seen in our over five years of doing analysis of cannabis is somewhat scary uh, in terms of all of the contaminants and problems that you can recognize. So it's a very contaminated supply chain when it's not regulated. There are molds, bacteria, um, all sorts of microorganisms that could be problems, um, pesticides, residual solvents and concentrates. And our, our general data tells us that about 25% of the time we can spot uh, microbiological contamination that would be over the acceptable limits that are present in Washington and are soon here, or already operating here in Oregon as well. That's a pretty big concern, and we've got initial data that says you can inhale some of those things. You, there are published reports of aspergillosis uh, inside of the lungs, which was presumed to be from cannabis, and we're now working on a project to verify that. Um, and I will describe a little bit later how we've already done that type of study with pesticides. Pesticides, as, as you're pretty well aware, are definitely a contamination concern as well. 
They uh, often get concentrated, so you might not even notice they're in the trim or the flower at any sort of appreciable level. But when you concentrate, you do concentrate most of the pesticides with that as well. So our general data says that about 10% of the time we'll find a pesticide. But when we went out and spot checked just in random, we saw over 35% of the samples had pesticides present. The disparity is because we're not handed stuff to say, tell me I failed the pesticide screen. So a lot of people had understood that they already had that problem and don't voluntarily submit it to the lab. So that's just one note about lab data. We're really only getting the samples that we're given or unless we've gone out and gotten them ourselves and then that's a little bit better of a random sampling picture. So, and obviously in concentrates, depending how they're produced, you can definitely see a lot of residual solvents and now states are starting to set limits about which types of solvents you can use and what their limits should be. And I should make a very important technical note. The previous presentation was talking about solvent use for analytical purposes. I hope to God no one is using methanol or chloroform or methylene chloride or, or hexane. So if anyone's using hexane, please do not use hexane. It forms a very toxic metabolite in the body. You can't get rid of it, and it is a big poison. So use heptane or pentane. Do not use hexane. It's uh, good in the analytical lab for tools like that, but definitely nothing for consumption. So it's important to understand what you're extracting and why. Uh, and that's, that's part of our goal, to educate people and to really demonstrate responsibility in a number of ways. So when we first started testing pesticides, everyone was like, why do I have to bother with that test? It, is it really a problem if it's on the plant? Can I consume that? Or is it destroyed in the combustion process? Which is an excellent question. Uh, and we said, very fair question. I'm not trying to charge you for an extra test. I would bet that they're going to be you know, in the inhalation stream, but we're gonna go and set forth to uh, study that and actually prove it. We had a wonderful intern that joined our team, a uh, very intelligent individual and exceptionally passionate about doing science. And we got a glass blower, um, SI pipe, scientific inhalation, that they provided the glassware and supported the study. So we took their pipe on the left. It's a, they pack it with virgin coconut carbon or cotton on either of the sides. It's called a triple filter McFin water pipe. And they also made a, a custom handheld glass pipe that we could use, which is kind of common. So we figured the different path lengths and also the different types of filters, how might you see what you can inhale in that fashion. And we took four specific pesticides, which are, are shown here. Um, Paclobutrazole being very common as a plant growth regulator, which you heard in the uh, question section tonight. And we spiked known amounts of those onto the plant material and then combusted them as if you were using that handheld pipe or the water pipe with and without filters and did so in a mechanical lung system. So no, no people were harmed, no animals were harmed doing this type of thing. Um, we used a series of traps that are cryogenic traps inside of a, a system that we custom built and could actually then quantify how much of those pesticides were going to be introduced into the lungs. So this really was alarming to us. The one with the filters has very little, about 10%, but without filters, up to 70% of those pesticides could be directly ingested into the lungs. So that's really like injecting it in your bloodstream. You're being you know, directly introduced to that. It's not an oral absorption, it's not going through the liver, it's not having any sort of absorption types of differences, as if you're eating it off of an apple. This is directly in your inhalation airway, which goes right into your bloodstream. So it was very, very alarming to us that it could actually be like in those types of quantities. Uh, and that is information that regulators can use in establishing what are acceptable limits. So we know that combustion won't destroy products. It will still introduce them into your uh, airways. Therefore, it's probably best to start practicing using things that we don't want to be exposed to in that fashion. Um, and, and we did publish that. That was our first paper that we published in the Journal of Toxicology in 2013. So the other aspect of our analytical lab is, is profiling of the plants. We do broad-based terpene and cannabinoid profiling, looking at around 40 different molecules at once to see what a chemical fingerprint is produced by the varietal or by the strain. Uh, and this has been a fascinating piece of work that we have just published, uh, and I'll have the, the references on the bottom here. So it's uh, dispelled a great myth that indica gives one set of effects and sativa causes another effect. Those are plant morphologies and cycle times for how long they're going to flower, but not necessarily the physiological effects a user may experience from that type of particular variety or, or strain cultivar. 
it, it's, to me, it was unethical to hear, this is going to make you go to sleep and offer that to a, an insomniac when you had no idea it would actually keep them awake. So I think we need to move forward to a system that really looks at what we call a chemotype and starts to use a chemical fingerprint to define the varietals, assign names or classes to them based on that type of profile, not just what it looks like in the garden. Those things are, of course, related and what you're going to you know, want to understand and how you cultivate it. But when you talk to a patient and you're starting to suggest or recommend what these types of physiological responses are going to offer you, it's important to be a little bit more informative and accurate, especially for people who are really suffering and ailing and are looking to this for medicinal use. So we're hoping that we can build a system that talks more along the, the chemical lines and defines how these types of profiles can be useful in identifying the plants for the right patient in that sort of fashion. So this paper just went up about a, you know, a week ago. So it's, uh, it's really hot off the press. And here's some of the pictures that we can generate from that. Um, it's a, an approach called principal component analysis. So we, we take all of these data pictures and we analyze them with a statistical method. And the algorithm is done in such a way that it tries to cluster uh, which types are similar based on all of those variables. So what we would see in a perfect world would be a pocket of sativa, a pocket of indica, and hybrids somewhere in between. But what you can see from this picture is that there's really a giant continuum and not much of, of any separation. So there are some differences, but not nearly as much as you would think when you hear indica does this, sativa does the exact opposite. And the next picture says how concentrates can be very different from the flowers as well. So we were able to analyze a large number of single name varieties and found in California that over 30% of the time, Jack Hare was definitely not Jack Hare of any type. So there's a lot of mislabeling, misidentification, and, and that's really irresponsible to the consumer in, in my opinion. So systems that are going to now say it's got to be fully regulated, you're going to have identifying labels, brand recognition from cultivators who've worked very hard to produce brand new breeds, they want integrity within that name, a system that authenticates exactly what that is and that shows up sealed and labeled on the shelf and no one can change the name, is really going to offer a very different selection process for all of the consumers so that you can start to find this particular cultivator with that particular name cultivar is the one that really works for me or the one that I like the most. And when you compare concentrates to flowers, you see that they're still very different. And the reason for that is most concentrates in their production methods are mostly devoid of terpenes. So what the data showed us was it's definitely not THC that is the differentiator in any of those. Well, if there is a large amount of CBD, it will pull it to the side and be different than all the THC ones, of course. But when I look at all the high THC cultivars, I see the difference because of terpenes. So certain terpenes will start to separate the data, and that tells us it's not THC that's the differentiator. That's pretty much common across all of them. It's all of those other organoleptics, the smell and taste profile that causes those different physiological response. Those are the important pieces that we want to see. And what this shows you is most of the time, concentrates are missing this. So it's very important to understand how your concentrate process was formed and what types of product you're going to have at the end. And as you seek to standardize those, especially for medicinal or other types of physiological purposes, you're going to really want to know that entire profile and make sure that it is reproducible and accurate every time. So yesterday, right, we had next to no regulations in some of these places, and we're seeing them start to develop now. And, and that was an interesting world to kind of just do whatever you really wanted, and no one was paying too much close attention. So you had contamination issues, um, unsafe harm that was caused to operators because they didn't understand the safety concerns. And I just have like one quick question for any of the operators out here. Who currently uses a rotovac or anything under vacuum? Anyone here use glass under vacuum? Yes. Are you aware that that can shatter on you and really be an explosion hazard right inside of your face? So, you know, it's, it's very important to understand the hazards of everything you're using. And we didn't see people that understood the hazards of butane and we hear homes and apartment complexes blowing up all the time. So it is important to understand these types of things, to seek out the right information, and the regulator is going to help you make sure that you know that. So while you could kind of get away with doing things in unsafe and different fashions before, 
moving forward, there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on your methodologies, your safety profiles, your safety protocols, and how you operate as a manufacturer to making sure you're doing this with the best safety regards to all of your employees, to yourself, and your entire neighborhood. And I think that that's really for, you know, for everyone's improvement and, and to better everything all along the way. So what that's going to require, though, is an increased level of sophistication. Um, so as we move to an area that is fully regulated, you'll start to see what these modern processing facilities look like. So we'll be able to invest in infrastructure, we'll be able to build up, you know, build buildings dedicated for these fashions. We're not going to have to see anyone hiding in an apartment complex or trying to do it in any sort of clandestine fashion. You will actually have, you know, well-wired electrical, safety protocols, all the hazard you know, protections in place and really operating in a very different fashion. What's also important is that you'll see a lot of quality control. What's coming into the facility, what's going out. The backbone of this operation will be analytical understanding and how good is the quality control and quality assurance of all the products coming in and going out of the building. And I think that that's going to be a very big differentiator from what we saw before. We'll know where the residual solvent levels are, we'll know if there's pesticides present or not, and this will all be approved and ready for release before it hits the dispensary shelves. So consumers will be protected in a much better fashion by seeing products that they know are clean and safe for consumption as dictated by the states as we continue to educate the regulator and lawmakers about what are acceptable limits and how you can go about approaching these products in this type of fashion. It, it will take a lot of, you know, kind of hand-holding with your regulators and education for them. Um, do you have a question? Sure. I can't hear you. Uh, it's the ketone. So it's the, the carbonyl function that forms on the second carbon is the one that's toxic out of hexane. Yeah, two hexane, correct. So we have taken great pains. I've talked to over five different state uh, lawmakers and regulators about how they can go about implementing testing regulations, where in the process these should be done so that they're cost effective and effective from a consumer protection standpoint. What information should be on the label? And I think when we start to look at cannabis, we're gonna you know, see these accordion type labels unless we start to come up with other ways of linking them electronically. There's a lot of information that we want and there's a lot of rich data for everyone to benefit from. How you make it accessible to some is really gonna be an important piece of that puzzle. Um, and you will have to now have approvals for your operating methodologies, for your facility, and how you have your training programs done. It's going to be very different in a, a number of ways as, as it used to be before. So I wanted to highlight some of the concentration methodologies and processes, and you can see some here. Bubble hash, keef. Uh, I consider bubble hash solventless because it's, it really doesn't leave a residue behind, but I, I do understand water is a solvent as well, so I, I won't argue that one too much. Um, clarified products can be made under both solvent free conditions or using a solvent initially, but you end up with a solvent free product. Sorry, solventless process, solvent free product is the best way to do that. And then typical solvent based methodologies are pretty popularized. Rick Simpson oils, alcohol extracts, um, wax, shatter, BHO are all derivatives of those things too. So if you look at these, what's the difference between all of those? Uh, a major difference would be what product do I have at the end and what's the form of that product? Some are going to be much more amenable towards formulation. So it's really difficult to take Keith and directly formulate that into a drink because you're going to have trichomes floating all over the thing. So it, that's a challenge. Uh, if you have a CO2 extract directly, there's a lot of fats and waxes and lipids with that. That would be very difficult to formulate into a drink product as well. You'll have those fats floating around. So a clarified product or something that's more refined would be a little bit more advantageous in that fashion for those types of formulations. I think you can say there's probably an advantage and disadvantage for almost every one of these processes up here. And, and that's the most wonderful part about cannabis. There's not one that's better than any other. There are ones that have advantages for some. There are some people that prefer or enjoy certain types of them, but there should be something for everyone. So there's no mine's the best, yours is the best, or someone's is better. Let's just say we're all gonna do it really well and do it you know, in the best possible fashion, and we can start to try and be as efficient and effective at delivering the largest diversity of products for everyone possible.
I think there are some different concerns in terms of scalability and economics might drive different choices. You'll see some artisanal things or products that will actually be desired because they're going to be small scale all the time, much like a microbrewery versus other large distilleries or breweries of that type. And that's, I think, all going to be really good for everyone to start to figure out what can we do with this plant in every possible way. And that's what this slide looks like today. It's probably going to double in the next you know, two to three years if we're lucky. We'll actually see that happen. There'll be new methodologies and new techniques for doing a lot of different things. I think one of the biggest concerns with solvent-based processes are what solvents are left behind and what's the actual residues that are there and what are the limits that we'll say are acceptable. So inhalation of ethanol can be exceptionally dangerous. So if someone does a winterization process and leaves a lot of ethanol behind, you can get a strong effect from just a small amount of ethanol being inhaled. That can contraindicate other medication, can cause a very you know, deleterious effect in terms of intoxication and actually build up to be toxic. So that way you can get very bad effects and you'd probably like to have your alcohol out of there. If you're using isopropanol, which is rubbing alcohol, I would never want to ingest or eat any of that either. So, and methanol, please tell me no one's using that one either because we definitely do not want to see anyone use that. It causes blindness or brain cancer. So we can hopefully all avoid that one. Solvent-based processes have flammability hazards that go with the methodology when being used and can have operational hazards to everyone around. I think we're, none of us here are, are ignorant of the fact that butane explosions have happened at ad nauseum and at really alarming rates. Handling that stuff properly and well-designed closed-loop systems you never eliminate the risk if you have it around. You can only mitigate it and minimize it as much as possible. So it really takes good, careful operating standards, good, careful operating procedures that you follow all the time, proper training protocols, and proper planning in the worst case scenario to handle that in the best possible uh, situation. Even the Texaco plant down in Torrance, California blew up not too long ago. So professional engineered systems still may have their faults, and there still are unfortunately humans that operate them. No one's perfect. So you have to be very careful about how you operate around those things. And like I said, the only way to eliminate the risk is not to have there them around. I'll take your question at the end. So which method do I want to choose? Which one might I want to ask a service provider to provide to me? And which one's going to be best for when? There's a lot of factors that go into that. So what am I trying to get as my end product? What are my economics in this situation? What's the scale that I'm interested in? And really, what's in the end product? So a dry sieve product is just the trichomes knocked off the, the plant. That's got a lot of the same components that you see directly on the flower. A water-based process will actually wash away some of those components. It won't be exactly what you see on the flower as well. Other types of considerations for those types of things, if I extract with a solvent and like alcohol and I evaporate that solvent, I'm evaporating next to all of the terpenes as well. So that was what that cluster data showed before. Most of those concentrates that we have seen on the market were devoid of all the terpenes. And why people come to cannabis and don't use single molecule isolates like THC and Marinol is because whole plant cannabis offers that entourage effect. And that's how you can kind of tickle the entire endocannabinoid system to really provide the most beneficial effects. So how can I get this whole host of molecules going to the body, let the body be the intelligent selector that says, I need some of these and some of that. I'll excrete or store the other components, but I can only do that if they're all offered at once. So single molecule THC or single molecule isolates like Ramanaban have been found to not be nearly as effective at modulating the endocannabinoid system because they're only hitting one specific target in one way. The magic of cannabis is when all of these things go with it. So if my production process to making a concentrate strips out all of those things and I have a 95% pure THC, why don't I just go buy some Marinol if that's what I'm after? So that's really not a whole plant or whole profile type product that we're after. There's got to be some other ways to, to get there. And I think combinations of these types of products or other methodologies to getting there are certainly what we're going to see more of. So I was asked to define the term fractionation. I know there's a, a lot of questions about that. And that was the definition I pulled off uh, the, the internet. And it's a, a separation process that's really based on some sort of gradient. And that's typically a polarity gradient. Um, most likely that's you know, the one you're gonna most often use. 
So I can say that I fractionated my salad dressing because I have oil on the top and water on the bottom. So if I threw an oily compound in there, I would put that in the oil layer. Uh, if I have a mixture of those, water-soluble ones go to the water and the oil-soluble ones go to the oil layer. That would, in the crudest of fashions, be fractionating my salad dressing. So if I put that in a separatory funnel and dripped out the water, I fractionated the, the polar from the non-polar. Um, it gets much more sophisticated if I look at something like the analytical chromatograms. So if I captured every one of those molecules coming off of there, I've got a unique fraction that I've collected, and that fraction may contain one or more of those molecules at once. So it really depends on your approach, your methodology, and how you want to go about collecting which types of fractions. Are they based on boiling point, by polarity, or other types of similarities, and how many things am I capturing at once? So you, you can see like you know things like ethanol, right? It can be separated from methanol, and that's very, very difficult and takes a lot of space basically to accomplish that. I could put all those together and get a, a much more crude fraction that may be acceptable for some uses like a cleaning solvent, but I wouldn't want to eat that stuff. So in general, I would say that's a, you know what fractionation is. Um, and CO2 is often, like since CO2 methodology is often sold as a methodology for fractionating different things, and it, it is in a crude sense. So I can get a, a more crude terpene fraction with some other stuff, I get a lot of the water fraction, and I can get a cannabinoid rich fraction with a lot of fats and waxes. But I will never see a, a CO2 production system that's getting single molecule isolates out of that. That's, you're not going to get a fraction that's that tight in that type of approach. So a little bit about what our unique terpene and service offering is, is that we noticed that with all these terpenes being devoid in the concentrates, it would be much more advantageous if you can add them back in. So we've developed a methodology that allows us to understand what's inside of the plant, recreate that type of profile using food grade components, and then reintroducing them into a concentrate that's been devoid of all of those terpenes. What that allows us to do is control all of the components that are in there so that it's standardized, reproducible, and we can start to tailor physiological effects as well as taste and flavor. Uh, and this is what we're calling our terpene infusion brand is Canaroma. And on the bottom here, we have two designations. Native is for all the components inside of that blend are found inside of cannabis. So a designation that lets the consumer kind of understand there's nothing funky in here that you haven't inhaled or utilized through cannabis before. And Inspired may use other types of flavor components from a different part of the plant world to kind of accentuate different flavors, but they have not been found in any cannabis samples that we've seen or in the literature anywhere. This is two examples of scratch and sniff stickers that we've created using this technology that you can put on the label. The regulator has said, you're not allowed to open the package anymore. So we said, well, sure, we'll just put the smell for that outside of it. So as he described earlier, it was, you, you can't smell cannabinoids. You're not missing anything there. So we'll just put these technologies together, and you can get a really good idea about what's going to be inside the package in terms of smell using a scratch and sniff sticker. So in short summary, the future is a, a very tightly regulated world. It's going to be a very different place where you're going to look for service providers, and, and such as ourselves, that are operationally sophisticated, that have strengths in analytical backgrounds, and are really going to make sure all your quality control and appliance or, or compliance is meeting with what the regulator wants to see. So you can hand us the plants and get your final produced products at the end, fully packaged, sealed, and labeled up. Uh, and you'll know that it went through all the regulatory steps in the right fashion. I think you'll see a lot more of those types of services as well as vertically integrated producers, and you'll see many different varieties of how people can produce products of different types and fashions. And, and as I said before, to me that's the most wonderful part of cannabis, all the diversity and all the differences that we're gonna get to see when everybody starts to you know, open their minds and play in creative fashions. Our effort is really in, in, you know, geared towards helping different products and brands. We will exclusively license back a specific terpene profile to a particular brand if they've created the plants that that comes from. So it was not of interest to us to try and grab anything from anybody. It was a way of protecting it for everyone and making sure that we can offer that back to them in specific fashions. And the cultivators work really hard to breed a plant variety. We want to give them credit and really work with them to help them you know, utilize that in all the derivative products possible. 
it's of no interest to ours that we're going to take that from them. And I, I want to be very clear about that. There's definitely been some comments floating around about our, our interest in that fashion. It is nothing other than helping other entrepreneurs be successful and making sure someone else didn't grab their stuff. Um, and I, I believe that's, you know, that's all for my slides today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Raber, for taking the time to hang out with us tonight and share this information with us. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Raber? Hi there. Uh, when it comes to regulation, do you also uh, foresee like safety equipment being required as part of Absolutely. Process? Yep. They have to be engineering stamped, UL approved. Things of that type. So Washington's regulations have certainly said every type of equipment you're going to use has to have an engineering stamp to be operated safely. So if you're custom building things, you're going to have to go through that process yourself. What about personal protective equipment like nitro gloves, N95 masks, Tyvek suits, things of that nature? I think, yeah, you should definitely have those in your operating plans and your safety protocol should dictate that. I don't know how much the regulator is going to force that on top of you. I think eventually as they start to understand when those are hazards and you should be wearing those things, they'll start to firmly define that. But I think they're kind of looking to us to guide them along those lines initially. And it's always better to be a little safe than sorry. And I think anyone that's worked around cannabis at all realizes a lot of people can have allergic reactions to it. And it's a big inhalation hazard, especially if it's all finely ground up. So personal protective equipment for inhalation is an important part. Standard practice in a lab is goggles and gloves and general protective equipment to make sure that you're covered and not exposed on your skin anywhere. Okay, thank you. Yep. I actually have a question. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you um, can speak a little bit to our audience about OSHA compliance in regards to this question. Um, do we, should cannabis producers, extractors, be expecting visits from OSHA? And they should, should they be looking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're probably going to put you on the top of their list. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of scrutiny in this industry. There's going to be more regulatory scrutiny and concerns about the industry than other industries. So I would think, you know, I think the bar is really much higher for anyone operating in cannabis than another industry. So liquor is probably one of the only other ones that would be close, but I would fur like fully expect tax audits, OSHA regulators, surprise inspections, and things of that type. You kind of have to always be ready at all times. You never know when they're just going to randomly show up at your door. On that note, I, I want to mention, I saw that there's an OSHA compliance uh, seminar happening in Portland next month, I think. Um, I don't remember the exact date, but I'm sure if you go to the OSHA website or Google their seminars, you can find the date and location for it if you're interested. Uh, I don't have a question so much as just a note for everyone who is uh, planning on using a hydrocarbon extractor. I know that it's a recent trend to perform de-waxing uh, using ball bearings in the weakest link of the extraction column, that is the sight glass. Uh, this is a fragmentation grenade. Yeah. And I, uh, I don't know what people are doing. There. <laughs> right. Um, Not a very good idea. So I just wanted to tell everybody, don't do that because yeah. you're actually endangering the entire neighborhood. Yeah. Creating projectiles. Yeah, making so, a bigger thanks. projectile than they do. I agree with that. Over there. Hey, Don, I previously worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I want to know if this is going to get to the level of GMP. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're certainly aiming for that. I believe that that's definitely where it's headed. Uh, good manufacturing practices for consumables. When you consider these are inhaled, inhalation standards in the pharmaceutical industry are always 10 times more stringent than oral standards. So the, the level of operation and sophistication you're going to have to get to are going to go you know, very, very high at the utmost levels and certainly be GMP based. And some states are already starting to really require that in their regulations already. So that, that will definitely happen. You spoke about uh, pesticides, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering um, if our best interest as consumers is really being considered. I know that, I mean, 
right now in commercial agriculture, they're feeding us pesticides on our fruits and vegetables. And is this really a concern? Certainly. I mean, so fruits and vegetables have a allowable daily intake limits, right? So they've studied animal models, typically rats or other things of that type, and fed on these types of pesticides orally and said, you know, if I give them this much over this many days, eventually they get cancer. So I'm going to try and make it a lot lower than that for people to consume. And it's kind of like the, the best educated guess that you can make and you err on the side of caution. When you're inhaling them, you don't have the same types of oral process. Like I said, no absorption differences, so all of it's pretty much exposed to your bloodstream. You don't have a first pass metabolism that may render it into something less harmful. It's that exact compound inside of you. So we have no data according to any of those types of things. So it's probably much better to err on the side of caution than not. And I've heard anecdotal instances where people said, I felt really strange. This didn't seem like cannabis, and we found pesticides in there. So they can certainly be known as neurotoxins. If you look up some of the MSDS or safety data sheet information on some of those components, they're alarming and frightening. So the toxicology profiles of some of them can be exceptionally bad. Plant growth regulators are ornamental only. So they're not even meant for consumption. So the, the harms that you could have in terms of hormonal endocrine disruption or other types of bodily harm that you're causing, this is supposed to help people physiologically. If you put those things on the product, it's gonna harm them. So I think we should err on the side of caution first um, and maybe even just stay there because I think you can cultivate this with safe components. You don't have to use those types of things and there's no need to put that on there. If you don't put it on there, you don't have to worry about having it come off or being exposed to it. I agree 100%. I just wonder if that's really something that's going to be enforced. Yeah, it's a, pesticides are an exceptionally tricky challenge um, for the labs to analyze, for regulators to set limits on, and you have to consider that a regulator looks at it like I'm going to remove someone's livelihood and pull their license for doing something of that type. I have to be absolutely sure I told them they can't do that at these limits and labs had to be accurate in finding it. And it literally is looking at needles in a haystack and every one of your haystacks is different and that needle can sometimes be different. So it's very, very hard to find it and it takes an enormous amount of analytical horsepower, much like OG Analytical has, to really find that the right way. It's, it's a solvable problem, it's one that you can tackle, but educating lawmakers and regulators about that is, I mean, they didn't go to school for science, and political science doesn't count in that respect, so I think it's a, a very different thing, uh, and it's, it's a challenge because they're hesitant to really put their neck on the line for something like that. But it should be done, and it will be done. We're, we're gonna keep pushing for sure. You'll hear more about pesticides and cannabis from our next presenter, Dr. Roger Mulgrew, as well. Any other questions for Dr. Raber? Are you taking applications for the Oregon workshop? Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. One more up here. I'm making my way. We'll make that the last one. Okay, this is going to be our last question. I guess it's a little different than the topic of pesticides, but um, there's the issue of like genetic modified food going around. Is that like the same with cannabis? Is genetic modified cannabis like dangerous in this supposed way that genetically modified food is? G GMO is a sensitive topic. It's a very challenging one. So how did you modify it for which purpose and where was that found? So if it's just a DNA tag and it had no physiological impacts on the plant, maybe that would be okay. If it's something that really manipulates it in other ways to make it grow or be pesticide resistant, it's still not the same plant that we know. So you can say like people are force breeding this in ways that nature would have never found. Is that genetically modifying it by some definition? How natural or unnatural is it? There's a blurry line in some respects there. And, and I'm not a fan of anything genetically modified that you're going to consume. It's probably better to leave it as natural as we had found it and utilize it in its natural form that way. So it's a, it's a very unknown question, and it really depends how it's been modified as to how harmful it can be. Thank you very much, Jeff.